Oh. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eve Samples. I'm executive director of Friends of the Everglades. I want to welcome you to our live stream discussion this afternoon. We host these clean water conversations every month to tackle a different topic. And this month we are revisiting a topic that is really um, central to environmental justice work in Florida, and that is the topic of sugarcane burning. The discussion that you'll hear about for the next hour with our guests, who I will introduce to you momentarily, um, will reflect on the sugarcane burning season that just ended. So burn season runs from October until May in Florida. And um, we, we see devastating effects in terms of air pollution, smoke and ash, and um, really detrimental effects that disproportionately affect communities south of Lake Okeechobee. You're going to hear from residents and experts this hour about that topic. So um, quick note before I do introduce our guests, um, we're able to bring you these live streams every month for free to help educate you on issues impacting the Everglades. And we just want to thank the support of our donors for allowing us to do that. So without further ado, I see um, our guest I'll introduce first got his uh, screen straightened out. And uh, Colin Walks is the former mayor of Pahokee and also representative of Sierra Club's Stop the Burn campaign, a community leader. And we're really honored to have you here today. Colin, welcome. All right. Thank you so very much for having me, Eve. Absolutely. Uh, and, and friends of the Everglades. Thank you all so very much. It's our pleasure. Next, I'll introduce Robert Mitchell. Robert Mitchell is co-founder of Muck City Black Lives Matter and a leader in the effort to stop sugarcane burning near Glades communities around Lake Okeechobee. And he also serves on the board of directors of Friends of the Everglades. And we're honored to have him here today. Welcome, Robert. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much, Eve, and everyone on the panel today. Thanks, Robert. Last but not least, we have Patrick Ferguson. Patrick is an organizing representative for Sierra Club's Stop the Burn campaign. Patrick is a wealth of knowledge on this topic. I know I have personally learned a lot about sugarcane burning from him, and we want to warmly welcome you here today, Patrick. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Great. So as, as I mentioned, um, the, the way we framed this conversation today is the last burn season. And I want to give credit to Robert for that phrase. Um, he mentioned it to me uh, a couple weeks ago. And, and this is, has a double meaning, right? Um, we're in May. We're in the last month of burn season, eight months long. And this is uh, going to reflect on the burn season that has just passed, the last burn season. And we also want to talk about making this the last burn season in Florida. Um, we know more than ever about the harmful health effects. We know more than ever about the very realistic alternative that exists, green harvesting. So there's just no excuse for letting one more burn season go on. So that's how we're going to frame this discussion today. Um, so I, I'm going to show a few slides. And, and as I do, I, I'd like to ask Colin, to describe um, as a year-round resident of the Glades of Pahokee, you know, what it looks like to have a front row seat to burn season, you know, what it looked like from your perspective, how it impacted your life, your family. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Colin, as I scroll through some of these pictures. All righty, thank you so very much, Eve. And once again, uh, welcome everyone that's on the uh, live stream there. Uh, we're happy to have you. Uh, Thank you for being a part of our advocacy here within the Glaze to ensure that we help to create a better quality of life for us, the residents of the Glaze area. Um, as a resident of Pahokee and of the uh, Glaze area, affectionately known as Muck City, I would really uh, uh, want to talk about the effects that, that we experience when our industry, and I say our industry affectionately, um, a lot of the time before I, I, I will preference before I start, um, we are supporters of our industry. We're just asking our industry to be better neighbors to us here within the Glades. Uh, none of us on this panel are here to try to eliminate any jobs or anything of that nature. Matter of factly, we're trying to help our industry to understand the, the diversity of economy that could happen when we green harvest. Um, but back to when uh, our current practice that our industry is doing now, which is uh, burning what they would call trash from the sugarcane stalks. And when that burning occurs, what happens because of 
the carrying of the wind. Uh, we have what's called black snow or the ash that will be falling from the sugarcane leaves as they burn off. And just imagine, you know, uh, when, when the burn season happens, it is happening during our cooler months of the year. Um, we really don't experience winter here in Florida, but that is the winter season, but it's more cool than it is winter. So during that time of year, you know, people are trying to be outside. It's nice weather. Um, we're uh, planning all different types of activities surrounding the holiday season, maybe Thanksgiving, maybe Christmas, maybe the New Year, birthdays, weddings. Um, just many activities are planned during that time of year. And when the sugarcane fields are being burned and the black snow is falling, the ash is falling upon us, it really creates a, 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 a major nuisance to us here within the community. Uh, just imagine that you're attending a wedding, your daughter is being married and uh, you come outside to take pictures uh, because it's nice and cool outside. But now she's wearing her white dress and we're all dressed nice and beautifully. And we have to endure that black ash falling upon us as we're trying to enjoy such an event as a wedding. Or even sitting in your backyard just trying to enjoy the cool weather that we experience during that time of year. And you have to endure the black snow falling upon you if you're enjoying a glass of lemonade, uh, if you're in enjoying a cool beverage. You know, it's just uh, falling within your beverages. It's falling on the food you're trying to enjoy. Just imagine if you're trying to enjoy your swimming pool and the cost associated with trying to keep your swimming pool free from ash falling in your swimming pool. Just imagine ash falling on your cars. You have to clean that up. Ash falling on your homes. You have to clean that up. So it's an extremely great nuisance to us. One of the things that I experienced this past uh, burn season is of course it's cool out. So we try to save as much money as we can on burning air conditioners and things of that nature. So we want to open our windows. So when you open your window and you're living close to the smoke and I experienced it firsthand where I went to work, came back home and I left the windows open but when I came home, the, my home was full of smoke. I live approximately, I would say, maybe two football fields from where the sugarcane was being burnt. And the smoke bellowed into my home. And, of course, now you're dealing with everything within your home smelling like smoke. I mean, from your curtains to your clothes. And, of course, there's a very small, because we, we see the ash falling, but there's very small particulate matter that's within that smoke. And now all of a sudden, your entire home is full of dust and soot. These are things that we have to endure as the uh, our industry burn. So we're asking them to uh, end that practice so that we can enjoy a better quality of life here in the Glaze community. And we're not here to... Uh, uh, fight with our industry. We're here to help our industry to garner solutions to issues we're faced with. We are the ones here within the Glades area that help our industry to thrive. We are, are the ones working in the fields. We are the ones that's driving the trucks. We are the ones that's harvesting the, the many different crops. So it's incumbent upon our industry to hear us out and listen to the solutions that we're trying to bring forward. And we're not just coming with an issue. We're coming with a solution to the issue. So our industry, hear us out and let's work together to uh, resolve what I, I see as could be a win-win for uh, us, the residents, our industry, a win-win as in diversifying our economy. If we green harvest, a win for the industry to uh, be a part of that diversity of economy and for us here in the Glaze. Thank you so much, Colin. You paint a very vivid picture of what it's like to live downwind of sugarcane burning. And, and people who have followed this issue closely or even casually, um, and there's a growing number of people who are aware now, thank God, um, they know that you can burn sugarcane 
when the wind is blowing in a manner that it will impact the Glades communities, but not when it's blowing to the east and would affect some of the wealthier coastal communities. It's, it's a really egregious example of environmental injustice in Florida. And, and that's part of why we're calling for the reform. Nobody should have to live downwind of this sugar cane smoke and there is an alternative. So um, I want to bring to life, uh, Colin, with a video, um, what you painted with a video that you took from your backyard. So I'm going to share this very short video because I think it will help people who have never witnessed sugarcane burning firsthand understand what you lived with, with that smoke coming into your home, um, burning just a couple football fields away. So I'm going to pull this up right now and you should be able to see this. Okay, so this is in my backyard. I would say it's about 250, 300 yards away from my back door. You know, and of course, you know, the ash is coming down, it's raining down. So, I stay on Main Street in Pahokee, and this is State Market Road with And the video is really not doing it a lot of justice because you can't really see the, the actual uh, black snow falling upon us, you know. But you can actually, when you look, you see the smoke is bellowing in the air and the flames. You can hear it roar. You know, you're, you're 200 yards away and you can still hear the flames roaring, you know. So just imagine all of the uh, animals that are running out of there. You, um, you, you have rabbits, you have uh, wild animals just running uh, across the street. Also, it creates a driving hazard within the community. Um, this is a main thoroughfare where there where the cane is being burnt and you can see cars uh driving through that uh, uh smoke which is uh, uh extremely difficult to see because it's directly in your path you can't you can't really see you're just driving based on the lane that you're in you're looking down at the lane and trying to stay within your lane and hoping that someone doesn't leave their lane or stop abruptly in front of you and as you can see, the many trucks that are driving by, it's an extremely busy road. And that smoke is directly bellowing across that uh, 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 highway and it's coming directly into my home, directly into my home. And the wind, of course, I stay west of what's burning. So the wind is blowing west. So it's blowing directly into my home. And. I, I had to come out and take the video. I, I mean, when I returned home from work, I started taking the video because when I got home, my windows were open, like I said, because it's a cool time of the year and you're trying to, you know, save on, on energy costs. So you open your windows just to keep your house cool upon returning back home. But when I walked in, when I walked in the house, it just triggered me. I mean, I was so upset. It just triggered me to just want to videotape this because I'm like, look at this. This is directly what we're talking about within our community. It's unhealthy, it's unsafe, the practice we're talking about, and it's just downright, it's an injustice to us here out here in the Glades. And we're asking our industry to uh, allow us to breathe, allow us to live a quality of life that everyone deserves, everyone deserves it. We're not upset with our Eastern uh, brothers and sisters in Wellington and Loxahatchee who fought to uh, have the industry not to burn while the wind is blowing towards their community. We support that. We're, and I know that they support us based on what we're going through out here because when they experienced it, they became so enraged until they started lobbying and protesting and doing all the things that you must do in your community to uh, garner a great quality of life. And that's what we're doing here, asking our industry to give us that quality of life that we're looking for, help us to diversify our economy by going green, helping us to become a more wealthier community within our health and within our pockets. 
thank you so much, Colin, for the, the narration of that video and for taking the video in the first place. The, the visuals that have come out of this past burn season have been compelling and undeniably show the impact. We can't sweep this under the rug anymore. Um, so on that note, um, I'm going to turn it to Patrick and I'm going to scroll through a, a few more photos from this past burn season as you're talking, Patrick. Uh, you know, the visibility of the issue was was one change we saw this past burn season, the increased visibility. Um, ProPublica and the Palm Beach Post also published a remarkable series of investigative stories on the harmful impacts of cane burning. The series of stories was a Pulitzer Prize finalist and brought international attention to the problem. And also, um, last but not least, the Palm Beach Democratic Executive Committee passed a resolution calling for a phasing out of cane burning and implementation of buffers. Um, so really remarkable momentum. I know none of this was easy, but it, it came up from the community. So, so Patrick, um, you know, why do you think leaders are finally paying attention to this? And so far, do you think that the increased awareness is creating change? Yes, definitely. And to start things off, uh, you know, I have to say that uh, uh, all the progress we're seeing now was uh, years in the making. Uh, this campaign, you know, formally got started up and running back in 2016. And uh, what we're seeing now is is testament to the, the hard work uh, and perseverance uh, of uh, folks like Robert Collin and the rest of uh, the leadership team uh, persistently speaking truth uh, to power and causing a lot of good trouble uh, to even get the word out. Because the whole the biggest obstacle that this campaign uh, had faced from the beginning was just educating uh, uh, the public beyond the folks who were directly impacted to the realities on the ground uh, of how this outdated toxic harvesting practice is negatively impacting uh, the surrounding communities and how uh, most developed uh, sugar cane growing nations around the world have realized this is a backward toxic practice and have engaged in phasing it out. Yet here in the United States, uh, you know, the Glades communities in particular have to disproportionately bear uh, uh, this outdated toxic harvesting practice. So uh, in the sugar industry, it spent a lot of time, uh, effort and resources in making sure uh, that the narrative that you're he hearing today uh, from folks on the ground, how they're directly impacted, uh, would not uh, get out to the larger public. And, uh, you know, there were several, um, uh, you know, failed uh, documentary projects and uh, attempts to really get the media uh, uh, to coverage, uh, uh, cover this issue in a manner that ProPublica uh, did brilliantly uh, to really uh, vindicate what this campaign has been saying all along, is that it's clear that this toxic smoke is harmful uh, to human health, the surrounding environment, and it's also clear that there are many benefits from the alternative and solution this campaign has been putting forth of green harvesting, which the industry uh, had pushed the false narrative beforehand that it was just impossible and infeasible to do uh, uh, within uh, uh, South Florida where sugar cane is grown, which we know uh, is false because they already are green harvesting. So, uh, you know, really, we're just beginning to see now the fruits of all that hard work and fighting to, to, to get this information out there. And as a result uh, of what we've seen with this uh, recent media coverage is you've got much more broader swaths of the public who are aware of this injustice. And with that awareness comes the necessary public pressure. And the most recent example of that is uh, the grassroots-led effort which led to uh, the uh, passage of that historic resolution, which not only uh, uh, called upon uh, uh, Commissioner Free to institute uh, the buffer zone uh, protection this campaign has been advocating for, but called upon the sugar industry to uh, uh, swiftly adapt green harvesting. So, uh, in summary, everything that we're, what we're seeing now, uh, and you know, this is the same with any. Uh, 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 movement for justice uh, is best summarized by uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And what we're seeing right now is that arc is bending towards justice. And there's a lot more to come, folks. This is just the beginning 
of this new wave of momentum uh, that's not going to stop uh, until uh, green harvesting is the status quo and there's a new era of prosperity and justice uh, for the Glades community and all folks who are impacted by this practice. So stay, stay tuned. There's more to come. Thanks, Patrick. One quick follow-up question. So the Democratic Executive Committee passed this resolution calling for an end to burning, a transition to green harvesting, and buffer zones in the meantime, right? Um, I, I just want to point out and ask you about the bipartisan nature of this problem and the bipartisan need for a solution, right? So both Democrats and Republicans in Florida have been guilty of tolerating this. And, and I just wanted to see if there's anything you'd like to add on that front. Absolutely. Let me just be very clear. This is a nonpartisan issue, non-political issue, although it's always uh, uh, manipulated and made uh, out to be. Uh, to break it down very simply, this is about human health, human dignity, racial justice, and about creating new economic opportunity uh, in a manner that is friendly to the surrounding environment. None of those things uh, uh, should be cordoned off as, oh, this is right, this is left. Uh, this is justice. And this is what this campaign uh, is all about. Uh, you know, so uh, all sides of the political spectrum, uh, you know, certainly there's, there, there's benefits that all sides should see and come together uh, on this issue, which really is a win-win-win for all parties involved. And certainly that also includes, uh, for the best, it's in the best interest uh, of the sugar industry as well. So it's just a matter uh, of getting the word out there. And now we're starting to see the results of, uh, of more of a critical mass uh, of folks being like, you know what, this does make a lot of sense. This is a win-win. And we're going to continue to build that movement. And uh, we're going to see a lot more uh, uh, of momentum build off of what we just recently seen uh, with that resolution being passed. But certainly nonpartisan issue, that's for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you for putting a fine point on that. Um, and I'm going to turn to Robert next, but I just want to point to this slide uh, first because the mounting evidence of the health impacts of sugarcane burning are undeniable. This slide comes from Dr. Ankush Vansal, who's with Clinicians for Climate Action, a great ally in this fight for justice. And it lists a number of studies that show the link between the sugarcane burning and eye inflammation, hospitalization for respiratory problems, um, respiratory distress in Maui, um, worse lung function, lung cancer risk. So the, the evidence is here. We could spend a whole hour diving into the evidence, um, but I just want to make note of that and then um, continue the conversation by talking to Robert uh, about his experience. So, you know, Robert, you grew up in the Glades, your mother lives in Belle Glade, and I'd love to hear your take on what kinds of impacts you've seen sugarcane burning have on your family. Thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you all for being here today. And as everybody has already said, um, the impact is significant. Um, I want to go in um, a little um, to help people just clearly see some things that they may not see of how it physically affects our community. As you heard Colin say, when we, we can't enjoy opening our windows, we can't enjoy sitting on the porches and things of that nature. But one element of it that stood out to me with my mom here and when our home here, you know that sugar cane actually destroys the roofs in the community. So when, when we have to go and um, repair our roofs, the insurance company, they, they tacked us very, very, um, very, very um, firmly against that. However, we have an industry here that is a billion dollar company that doesn't provide not one incentive to the residents, not one, not one penny. But however, if you know, I think people out there listening will, 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 will be very surprised to know the contributions that the industry has done to other communities outside of the Glades. Are you hearing me there? So, mm -hmm. so we have a billion dollar industry that allows our communities to be ranked not, 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 not number 20, 30, number one poorest communities in Florida. That's Bell Glade. Bell Glade is number one poorest. Pahokee is number three and South Bay is number nine. So we all make the top 10 poorest communities in our communities, having an industry pouring soot and black snow up on our on our cars, on our roofs, everything to deteriorate the things that we have to enjoy a coming life there. So this is something that I, I wanted to make very clear to our audience out there that this is not an issue 
um, about, like you say, no, no propaganda. This is not a bipartisan type of situation. Absolutely. This is um, us asking our industry to be better neighbors. Um, how could you sit back and watch? And, and the thing about it is the industry, because many people may not know, but you have like the, the, the headquarters, um, Florida Crystal's headquarters, they're over in West Palm Beach. So even that building does not endure the ash that this roof has to endure. We need to think about that. So, you know, I just love that we have a lot of solutions right now because we're not coming to the table empty handed. We're not coming saying, oh, we just have a problem. We have a common sense solution, a common sense solution that that our that our allies in Brazil, who is just as large as the sugar industry here, has already shown that not only does green green harvesting by green harvesting, that it produces more jobs, but it also increases the yield by 20 percent. It also produces the yield. So, so to, to the people in the muck that may have concerns about, hey, if we was to do this, are we going to lose jobs? No, you will have more jobs, M more jobs than we probably can handle. And we will have to continue bringing people from the outside right now because that's something that I also wanted to point out right now. In our industry right now, you really have less than 19, you have 19% or less of the residents actually in the glaze that actually works for the industry. So you have over 80% of the people in the residence enduring the smoke that doesn't even work for our industry. However, they are busing um, our fellow neighbors from the outside who doesn't have to endure with the smoke as we do six to eight months out of a year. They're busing them over here to work, work the fields, keep the smoke burning and sending them home to clean the air. And yet it's still the people, the educated people of the muck, the educated people, the proud, the hardworking people of the muck are the ones left to endure this. And, it's, and you notice we said the last burn season. The last burn season, absolutely, it should be the last burn season because when 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 the people over in Wellington, Royal Palm, back in um, the 1990s, we all know that 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 area had to develop. When they was coming in, they made the complaint, they made they they gave outcries, and the state, along with the sugar industry, provided protections that when the wind is blowing to the east, they cannot burn. However, when the wind is blowing over the beautiful communities of the glades. It's an open burn. And that right there is an issue right there. And as we said, our ERs, they have the, they have the data to prove it. They're in, in burn season, they're full with asthmatic um, patients. Look at the research, know what it is. But to me, this is common sense. If you see those images that was shown earlier, anybody with common sense understands that that's not healthy. As we as we support things with um with, with big tobacco and no, and no smokes of that nature, this right here should be a total outrage. A total outrage, and I'm hoping with all the all the allies that we have around around the world right now that some attention will come in, and it would absolutely stop and make this the last burn season. And if not the if not just the last burn season of green harvesting, actually give us the the, the buffers that we're asking for, the buffer zones around our communities, um, just as they have done in other areas. And, and, and anyone that travels over to Cluston and you see the Walmart there, wonder why you never seen the ash on the parking lot there because they have protections there. And I want those protections around the muck. That's the, the, the whole muck. Muck City, Bell Glade, Pahokee, South Bay, and Harlem and Cluston. So thank you guys just for being allies and bringing this um, attention to our community. But it's time for change. And this absolutely needs to be the last burn season. We're too smart for this. We're too smart for this Palm Beach County. So let's let's end this and, and, and let's, let's restore humanity. Let's see, and we can start in the Glade. So thank you guys. Thank you, Robert. I'm, I'm going to show one more short video. And after our audience watches this video, um, I, I want everyone to ask themselves, how could you not be an ally in this battle when you see that this is what's happening in the community? The beautiful city of South Bay. So this is South Bay, one of the communities in the Glades that's impacted by sugarcane burning. And this is from this past burn season. You can see how close the burn occurs to the road, how residents are downwind of that smoke. So it, it really brings the issue to light. And interestingly, right here, you know, as, I, as I've shared information before, because I have a niece that suffers with asthma, her home is literally across the street from what, what, what the audience is watching right now, literally cross the street so you understand that it's no playtime when when we have this the windows are closed and everybody is inside trying their best to stay away from this toxic burning which is the, and, and, and it's not just the burning but it's the chemicals that are burning in this here that makes it more of a 
of I know when the when, when the real facts comes out in a, in, in a more worldwide way, we're going to we're going to ask ourselves, how could this ever been happening to a community? But but one thing that will be clear you that, that, that everyone can see, these are black and brown communities. Notice that it's black and brown communities that they're doing it to. However, when it becomes a little more affluent in the wider communities, they're not seeing what we're seeing here now. And I don't blame them. No one should see this, but neither should we. So, yes. Thank you, Robert. So so it's May. It's officially the last month of burn season and we have five months till it starts up again. Um, and, and let's just be clear. There are two entities that could end this, decide to end this tomorrow in Florida. So one is the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, currently led by Nikki Freed, the Agriculture Commissioner. They set the regulations that govern burning. They could decide to impose the buffer zones, 27 to 30 mile, and eventually phase out burning completely and shift to green harvesting. And then the other entity is the companies themselves. And, and let's be clear about who we're talking about. The half million acres of sugarcane south of Lake Okeechobee are primarily owned by Florida Crystals, headquartered in West Palm Beach, as you said, and U.S. Sugar, which is headquartered in Clewiston. So would it be, would there be some startup costs in making this transition? Sure. But as Brazil has shown us, this can pay off in the long run, and there are just no legitimate excuses for not protecting public health. All right. So I'm, I'm going to turn it back to, to Colin. Um, Colin, you know, these two companies, U.S. Sugar and Florida Crystals and the industry as a whole, are very politically powerful, one of the most powerful in Florida, and speaking out against them, especially in the Glades communities where they, they hold significant clout, um, requires bravery. So I'm just hoping you'll, you'll tell us a little bit about how you came to be a vocal advocate on this issue and what kind of backlash you may have faced. All right, thank you once again for the question. Um, the reason I got involved in the uh, campaign to uh, stop the burn, go green is, um, because once again, when you when you have left our community, I grew up in the community, graduated high school, went off to college, served in the military. So you start living a certain quality of life. I returned back home in 2010. And immediately upon returning home, I uh, say about two to three months, I returned back home in August of 2010. And about around... October, November of 2010, I started experiencing uh, extreme uh, itching. Uh, you know, my I started with uh, on my tongue and then my nose and my ears and my eyes. And eventually, you know, all over my body just itching. So I'm like, what the heck is going on? So I went to an allergist, you know, and uh, uh, had some uh, tests ran, you know, to see what I'm uh, being uh, what's triggering these allergies, you know, the itching. And lo and behold, uh, smoke. <laughs> I didn't know smoke could uh, cause itching. But then it was told to me is not the smoke, it's what's in the smoke and what's falling on you and what you're breathing in. So the insecticides, the pesticides, the herbicides, all of these things is what's in the smoke. So when you inhale it and when it falls upon you, this is what's triggering all of the eye inflammation, all of the throat inflammation, all of the stuffy noses, you know. So now, subsequently, I have to take an allergy pill on a daily basis. So this is what triggered me uh, to want to do something about it. But I did not know where to turn in 2010. I, around 2016, 15, Pat uh, came to our community and... I sat with Pat and Pat started talking about green harvesting. And I was like, that makes sense. I mean, everything he started talking about made sense because I was experiencing all of these, this health issue of stuffy nose, uh, watery eyes, itchy throats. You know, I was experiencing it. So I'm like, well, let me get involved with this because the burn needs to stop because the doctor told me what was causing what was happening to me. It's, it's not hay fever, it's not grass allergies, it's not, you know, it's not the normal environmental things that you would think would be causing your allergies, pollen or things like that. It's the actual smoke and what's in the smoke that's causing my allergies uh, uh, to flare. And I'm quite sure there are many other uh, 
members within the community that's experiencing a lot of allergic reactions, but they don't know where it's coming from. They don't understand what's happening to their bodies based on what's happening in the environment around them. So um, getting involved, of course, it, it, it takes a, a lot of courage because you're speaking out against a giant, an economic giant, a politically connected giant. So it's extremely, uh, it takes a lot of bravery to do so because within the community, there are agents within our community that's fighting on behalf of the industry so that they can continue these practices. And these are uh, elected officials. These are business owners within the community. A lot of the times, uh, uh, your own family member, your, your, your own family member uh, that's experiencing a lot of the health issues because of the fear of the fear mongering that's put forward by the, the industry. If we stop this practice, um, there, there may be jobs lost. Of course, now when you threaten a person's livelihood, heck, you know, I, I'll, I'll take health, a health risk uh, to maintain income coming into my home, which is backwards thinking. Because if you are experiencing health issues to the point where you could possibly lose your life, what good is money if you're not here to enjoy it? So there's a lot of education that has to happen within the community so that we can understand that uh, holding our industry to an account does not make us a villain. It actually makes us an ally to our community, to our families, to our friends. We're here fighting on your behalf and we're asking you to join with us. Uh, stop fighting with us. Stop arguing with us. Stop trying to blame us. Stop putting the propaganda out there because what you're doing now, you're inadvertently or, or you know what you're doing. I'm not going to say inadvertently. You know exactly what's going to happen when you uh, do these types of things. I personally experienced losing my job because of my advocacy against the industry. The industry is extremely powerful. My employer at the time, uh, because an agent within the community got next to them, joined their board, and they did not understand this person was not there to help the community to bring forward the mission of the agency. They were there to safeguard the industry from anyone that would try to dare speak out against the industry. So organizations have to be extremely aware of who you are bringing onto your boards, who you are sharing your funds with. You have to be extremely cautious of these individuals. They're not here to uh, bring justice to the community. They may claim that, but that's not their aim. Their aim is to enrich themselves and support the industry and the habits that harm us here in the glades. They're not there to promote education. They're not there to promote health of the community. Heck, they're not even there to promote uh, uh, diversity in the economy. They're just there to uphold the industry's practices that's harming us. So we have to see these individuals, um, call these individuals out and let these individuals know that we see you we see what you're doing within our community and it has to stop. Either you're with us or you're against us. You have to stop. You have to just stop. And I'm being cautious not to call direct names now because more information is being gathered on these particular individuals and entities so that when we do address them, we can address them appropriately. May it be through legal means or through being on the streets, just protesting and letting our community know exactly what the agenda is of these individuals. Thank you for that bravery and to lose your job over speaking out, I'm sure um, was very disconcerting and it, it makes your continued advocacy all the more admirable. So thank you, Colin. Um, so as a result of this increased awareness that we've talked about that has occurred over the, the last burn season, we've seen some responses, right? So Agriculture Commissioner Nikki Freed has, has talked about some purported improvements. Um, I wanna ask you, Patrick, if, if there's any truth to that, are we making any progress um, in terms of regulations or otherwise? And, and maybe you'll tell us a little bit about the scope of this past burn season in terms of size. 
Oh, and you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, yes, uh, to start, um, uh, since Commissioner Freed has, has taken office, we've seen uh, a concerted effort to at least uh, put forth the appearance that progress is being made uh, uh, on this issue, which uh, unfortunately, in really breaking down uh, the purported uh, 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 changes and you know, if that's leading to more green harvesting, uh, less negative impact from the burn on the surrounding uh, communities, uh, none of these purported changes have standed up, stood up to such scrutiny. And uh, you know, a lot of words such as uh, we're encouraging the industry to green harvest, but uh, <laughs> the, the encouraging uh, you know, isn't doing much, especially when you have the regulatory authority to put in measures such as the buffer zone protections that will actually put the industry on the path towards uh, uh, the right direction. And you know, to really sum things up, uh, we've already seen more uh, approved overall burn acreage this harvesting season than we've had uh, in the last harvesting season. Uh, and, um, you know, I even look today, uh, we're, we're, this is May 26th, with the end of May, folks. Uh, and today there's over 16 burns on over 800 acres uh, roaring away uh, uh, within uh, the Everglades agricultural uh, greater area today. So, uh, and you know, you've heard from, from uh, uh, Colin and Robert and how things have been on the ground. Uh, and you know, uh, whatever's been said, uh, you know, the real results as far as improving the quality of life environment, uh, you know, uh, creating more green harvesting uh, and creating uh, this green job potential uh, has not been there. Uh, and that's been very unfortunate. But one of the uh, things that we've seen, uh, and this is, comes from Commissioner Freed's uh, um, you know, quotes when asked about the issue uh, herself, has been uh, very disconcerting. And it's along the lines that, uh, hey, we would like to do more, uh, uh, but uh, we've been afraid that if we would, that the powers uh, invested uh, in the agricultural commissioner would be uh, taken away by the Republican-dominated uh, legislature. Uh, with her being the only um, uh, Democrat uh, elected in a statewide uh, office uh, there as agricultural commissioner. And that's a cop out, folks. Uh, and that goes back to, you know, trying to insert politics. Uh, and it was essentially not uh, a political issue. And um, to really, uh, because this comes up so much, uh, to put things in perspective, uh, you know, I go back to, to some of the things I've heard from folks in the community that I carry with me. Uh, in particular, uh, during uh, the heat of the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, uh, uh, the Glades communities were, were very early hotspots within South Florida. I've been seeing all the medical research about uh, um, how folks suffering from COVID are recovering more vulnerable to respiratory health impacts from pollution. CDC comes out with a uh, guideline saying, I recommend farmers don't use open burning practices uh, in areas surrounded by highly populated areas during the course of the pandemic. All these material, all these, you know, underlying uh, factors were in place that Commissioner Free really could have stepped up to the plate uh, and uh, taken that bold action to show that, you know, she's, she's you know, putting Floridians uh, uh, first before politics and special interests. And then when it really hit home for me, and of course we sent it sign on letters, we had medical professional organizations sign on, uh, uh, and these, the sign on letter said the commissioner free was completely ignored. In addition to many attempts to get a, a, a virtual meeting with the, uh, South Burn leadership team completely ignored. But then when I get a message, uh, and I hear from a family, it said uh, that after uh, their father had uh, recovered uh, uh, from COVID-19, spent some time in the hospital, went back to work uh, out in the fields, uh, and there's a sugar cane burn where he was working. Uh, I was told that he had uh, uh, collapsed, was sent to the hospital, and died later on that day, cardiac arrest. Uh, and that family believes that uh, sugar cane burning uh, uh, was, was a direct factor uh, in his death. And then, you know, I, I go back to the conversations I've had with folks with COPD uh, who, who tell me that during the burning season, leaving my house at certain days would be a matter of life or death. And then I think to myself, uh, you know, when you hear politics being inserted um, and, oh, uh, you know, I couldn't take action on this because, you know, I'm afraid of uh, the political ramifications. We're talking about life or death here, folks.
if you have the ability uh, uh, as um, uh, an elected official uh, to enact rules that can save lives, uh, then that transcends politics. Uh, uh, you know, that should transcend concerns about, you know, pushback from special interests. And that's what we need, folks. We need fighters uh, who can put the health, welfare of Floridians uh, and the environment uh, uh, ahead of special interests and, and, and ahead of these political concerns. And um, so unfortunately, that's a, a long-winded uh, response to the question of uh, have we seen real progress? And not nearly not even close to the progress that needs to be there. But, uh, you know, this movement's only growing uh, and uh, and it's just getting stronger. We're going to keep on fighting and we're going to get there. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so when we first got acquainted with the Stop the Burn effort in 2020, Friends of the Everglades sent uh, did ask for a meeting with Commissioner Nikki Fried, too, did meet with some of her staff, made all of these points. They listened, but inadequate action has been taken since then. Uh, Friends of the Everglades supporters sent thousands of messages after that to Commissioner Freed's office asking for buffer zones and an ultimate phasing out of burning to be replaced by green harvesting. That hasn't happened. So today um, we want to announce that we're launching another petition demanding an end to this. So please, um, you can look in the chat on Facebook or on YouTube and sign this action. It's calling on the state of Florida and it specifically mentions the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services to, to finally end sugarcane burning. So you, you can scroll down if you go to our site and read the whole thing, but we're gonna keep the pressure on. And um, I think what you said, Patrick, about despite the increased awareness and the, the increased um, anger um, about this injustice, the fact that more acres were burned this past season than the year before really, um, shows that our our leaders are not listening so let's let's keep the pressure on and, and make sure they do um all right so i have one more question for robert and then we'll take some questions for our audience if you're watching live on facebook or youtube you can put your question in the chat and we'll get to as many of those as we can i see some um, good comments out there now thank you to everyone who's tuned in um, so so robert i just was hoping you could talk a bit about green harvesting and the potential it has for the Glades community. We, we haven't discussed that much today, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, I can, and thank you so And So many things are being discussed here, and I just want people out there to understand that Nikki Free, when you hear that, understand that she had the power to stop this, and she did not, and yet and still she's trying to go for governor of our great Florida state, so I want y'all to think about that. We do need fighters, um, but over to the, gr the great solution that Nikki did not implement of green harvesting. Green harvesting, um, when, you, when, you, when you green harvest in the community, this is pretty much taking the trash that they normally would burn, the things that are choking us right now, and you, um, you, you have it converted over to things as mulch. You also have um, um, biogas to produce electricity, biofuels for ships, biochar, tree-free paper products, cattle feed, and medicine, and more. Are you hearing me? So to the muck out there, we 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 we're rated number one poorest right now. However, if we get if we get companies that that, that come in to convert the sugarcane lease, such as um Birdie Visions, to come in, who's already ready to come in and convert our sugarcane lease right there, that's going to produce more jobs. Because one thing that we don't talk about is the type of jobs that the industry do provide. But I talk to the residents. I know the real, and I know the low the low pay that they receive out there for all of this labor. Y'all hear me right, audience, the low pay that the industry pay workers right now. However, we was to bring green harvesting um, um, contractors in, um, the jobs will go, you will have more jobs and you will have better pay. You will better pay. You would no longer have to work your fingers and bones with the overtime hours that you do at the industry just to make a regular day's pay. Because right now, our residents, that's how they get the money there. The money is not necessarily in the regular eight hour like um, the most of the residents in, um, in, in, in the muck is doing, because again, we have 19% of the residents in the muck actually working there. However, they're able to make the monies over years over the hard labor, which um, extends over eight hours to actually get a decent pay. So again, what green harvesting will provide will be more jobs, cleaner air for everyone. It is a win-win solution. And not only that, the sugar industry was already going to green harvest anyway back in 2008. It's on record. We have that, guys. They spoke everything you hear being shared today. The sugar industry already knows. However, that that went, you know, that was during the market crash. And I'm not sure exactly 
um, why they didn't um, complete that there. But they already they already said of the beautiful benefits that it would do for a community. So we have to ask ourselves in the muck, why? What is the real agenda here? Is the agenda really to smoke our people out? Because you just was told right now during, during a pandemic that affected respiratory <laughs> issues, they turned it up. They burnt even more on us. So that has to be a clear industry to anybody out there that says that you have a good a good heart for the for for, for humanity, you know what I'm saying? To, that, that that's not right. Um, you was even given provisions, like they said, to not do so, but it was done anyway. So we just need to talk to our industry. Listen, that is not the way you be a good neighbor. Period. Whoever told you that, that's not the way that you do it. And we are here to make sure that that does not happen. But green harvesting is the way. It's a win win. And don't take don't just take my word for it. If you, if you hear these things, guys out there listening, do your research yourself and you'll be just like me that said, huh? What? This is common sense. How are we not doing this? Because it, it would actually make the industry more money to green harvest. More money. It would help our soil more. You know what I'm saying? And that's another thing because I want us to be able to, to change our slogan there because I think that theme is holding us down because we have a theme that says her soil is a fortune. But everyone in the muck, we need to make sure that we add to that, that her soil and her people are her fortune and maybe they'll get it right and let this be the last burn season. Thank you so much, Robert. If anyone wants to do more homework on green harvesting in particular, there's a great uh, webinar video that ProPublica did with experts from Brazil who went into detail about exactly how the industry changed there. They phased out burning, they implemented green harvesting, and it's a real success story and it can be done. Okay, so we have a, a few minutes left. We're going to take some questions from our audience and I'll... Um, just ask Ali Hartman, who is our communications director behind the scenes, to share any questions that she may see coming in. Okay, we have a question from Rhonda Roff. Hi, Rhonda. Thank you for watching today. She says, recently there was a notice that air quality monitors would be keeping us informed about Sahara dust. Do the monitors really exist or not? So good question about air quality monitors. Who would like to tackle that one? Um, Patrick? Uh, yes. So, um, you know, certainly there's there's a statewide network of, of air quality monitors, uh, you know, placed uh, uh, and there's more monitors in more urban areas. So uh, in referring what I think you're referring to is uh, there's been a lot of reporting uh, surrounding uh, uh, the one singular monitor. And uh, and there's been several reported issues with that singular monitor, uh, which is within the sugarcane uh, growing region in total, located uh, in Bell Glade. So, um, you know, yes, that would be included within the, um, you know, statewide uh, network, uh, which I believe you're referring to. Uh, and, um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, that could be, be another red herring uh, that the industry would rely on. Uh, oh, it's all Sahara dust, but, uh, you know, rather than sugarcane burning as far as there being uh, any spikes. But, uh, you know, and certainly there, uh, you know, the Sahara dust does cause uh, uh, air pollution and increase PM 2.5. Uh, but, you know, that shouldn't uh, uh, mitigate or, or, you know, take anything from the way that, uh, you know, for six to eight months out of, out of the year. And let's be real, we're talking about eight months uh, at the end of May here. Uh, there's no point in even using six anymore because the last few years it's been well to the end of May, almost going into June. Uh, and, um, and, you know, a lot of the reporting, uh, especially in ProPublica, was able to show that, hey, these short term spikes uh, of air pollution aren't being uh, uh, picked up in the existing air quality monitor and can't be used as a, as a proxy to say, hey, our air is clean because uh, we're not uh, uh, violating any, you know, uh, national uh, or annual averages put forth by um, the EPA's National Ambient Air Quality Monitoring Standards. But uh, a lot, I mean, so much research is building up uh, on the fact that, uh, you know, uh, not only are exposures to pollution below those levels still harmful to health, but the issues that uh, these monitors uh, aren't built uh, to be able to accurately depict the real-time pollution exposures 
from a practice such as pre-harvest sugar field burning that takes place over an area, you know, we're talking over 400,000 acres. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, not, again, long-winded response, but, um, you know, yes, there's a, uh, uh, in a statewide air quality monitoring network that does exist and uh, it's nowhere near uh, 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 perfect. I'll put it that way. Yeah, the ProPublica Palm Beach Post methodology was really interesting because they got uh, mobile uh, technology in the hands of locals so they could communicate what they were actually experiencing in terms of air quality and then compare that with the inadequate monitoring system that was in place. And, and it showed, it, it ground truthed the, the impacts. So, okay, we can tackle another question or two here. Okay, Miss Scarfoot, I like that name. What about Charlie Crist? Also, wouldn't there be an increase in eco-friendly businesses by being green? What about growing hemp to clean up Big Sugar's mess? Um, so a few questions there. Let's see, we can, we can ask about the increase in eco-friendly businesses. Um, you know, Robert, you alluded to that. Does anyone wanna expand on, you know, what industry could come to the Glades? if if we embrace green harvesting oh absolutely yes because we have um again biofuel and biofuels is, is, is fuel to um fuel ships so we we would we would have that production but also it makes it makes feed for cattle um it produces electricity so we have a lot we have a lot of um possibilities that will come into the community i think more than we even know um they're just sitting there and they're waiting and um and i will ask this to patrick patrick um Definitely bring that in a little bit on there for us, Patrick, because I know that you specifically did some research on that specifically. So, Patrick, um, answer that one there. Yes. Yeah, so, so in short, there's there's all kinds of options, and uh, uh, your your question also points to uh, alternative crops too. Uh, of course, we're talking about some of the most fertile land uh, uh, east of the Mississippi. Uh, and, um, you know, certainly, you know, and there's a lot of other crops. Uh, it's the winter vegetable capital of the world that's currently uh, grown uh, in the glades. And um, so certainly, you know, when we're talking about all the opportunities that, that's out there, let alone with just maintaining sugar, but creating more byproducts from sugar, it's, you know, there, there's a lot to choose from. Uh, but what's most important is, is trying to prioritize uh, you know, what could be the solution that could be, you know, the best win, win, win for all parties involved. And that's why we focused in more on um, just, you know, sugarcane byproducts uh, in general, uh, uh, which, you know, could more readily be taken advantage of uh, under the, you know, the current, you know, business model uh, that's in place. And I would direct you, if you go to the Stop the Burn web page, uh, on our resources page, uh, you know, gathered a, a lot of links to learn more about uh, all the different, like existing companies from around the world that uh, are, are utilizing the sugarcane trash. Uh, and, you know, there has been interest, uh, you know, communicated by existing companies to uh, uh, come into uh, Florida, the Everglades agricultural area, uh, you know, seeing, um, you know, that there's there's more awareness spread on, uh, you know, the issue caused by this. And there's people, there's growers already around the world that uh, are using, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure uh, uh, is a good way to look at it. Uh, and that they're currently doing things that can be um, uh, adapted and tailored for Florida's environment. Uh, and uh, can create new sources of revenue for the industry, uh, um, variety of bioproducts, check out the website, uh, and also create new jobs. Now, of course, this requires capital investment for, for, for a lot of them, depending on what we're talking about uh, to a greater uh, or lesser degree. But when we, you know, when we really break down, uh, and this is reported all the time, the millions of dollars that gets flooded uh, into the political system from the industry, and you got to ask yourself, well, how, how much of that money uh, uh, could be, you know, uh, uh, devoted to, you know, implementing, you know, research and innovation uh, and, uh, you know, expanding these revenues rather than basically going into the political uh, 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 system uh, used fundamentally as bribes uh, uh, to keep, uh, you know, the smooth policies in place to greatly benefit 
uh, the domestic sugar industry and cause and and lead to regulators who should be doing their job uh, to regulate these toxic, outdated practices uh, out of existence, so our industry can adopt the 21st century. Uh, uh, but we're not seeing that. So uh, you know, once again, another another long-winded uh, uh, answer there, but. A lot of, lot of bioproducts, uh, Robert mentioned a few, biofuels, tree-free paper products, uh, commercial mulch, uh, not to mention actual mulch that the industry can use uh, 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 to help uh, you know, engage in regenerative agriculture, improve the health of soils over time. A lot of benefits uh, on that front. Uh, disintegrant for medicines. Um, you know, I've been contacted by a researcher who found out uh, um, you know, all these things that can be created. So there's a lot. Check out uh, uh, the Stop the Burn um, uh, Go Green uh, campaign website uh, for more information. We'll, we'll yeah, make sure that gets and, to the and chat. Real quick, mm -hmm. real, yeah, Patrick, because I just want to add but that people out there listening understand that it can also be expressed. Green harvesting is also expressed. You can say green gold. If you know the value of gold, this is what the, this is what our leaves can be actually um, attributed to green gold. So understanding that also with this, it will take conversations of making sure that the best the best um, fit for our community is there. But that's why it's important with our leadership as well, because you will have people at the table that can make sure whatever industry is coming in is coming in directly to erase the whole the whole um the whole rating that says we're number one poorest city. So again, when I say what industry wants to come in, we can make that competitive to come in and make sure that we're getting top pay, top pay, not, not, not just at the headquarters at Florida Crystals, because you know, the workers never see that type of pay. Um, um, and, I, and, and I wonder how many um, of African-American up there as well, but that's another conversation there, but this is something, something that we can be in front of. So understand that it is a conversation to be had, but we already have a lot of um, research that shows this is a win-win common sense solution. So yes. Thank you. And, and I just wanna quickly note that this industry, its profits are heavily protected by the federal government and federal taxpayers in the farm bill. So um, we are underwriting this action, this, this harmful action as federal taxpayers and, and our own government is underwriting it. So just a quick point there. And then we have one more question I want to get to. We're going a little over, but I'm, I'm just going to say that's all right. We'll take five more minutes to wrap it up because this is good. Um, all right. One more from Rhonda. She says, is there any difference between the quality of discharge water from the fields from burning versus green harvesting? Um, so we call these discussions clean water conversations because normally we're talking about water. Sugarcane burning mostly pertains to air pollution, but there is a water impact. Um, Patrick, I know I've heard you talk about it. Anyone who, who would like to answer that, please dive in. Sure. So um, first and foremost, there's a lot of research, uh, and we have some of this linked on our, our campaign website too. Uh, and, and, you know, when it lists pros and cons for different harvesting styles, burnt versus green harvesting, one of the things that consistently comes up, uh, in addition to fighting against soil uh, uh, erosion, which is a big problem in the EAA, uh, if you're using uh, the leftover trash uh, as, as mulch um, uh, to be left down on the ground, that also increases uh, the water retention of the soils versus um, uh, you know, the soil being left with no trash. Uh, so that's that's one factor talking about uh, a diminished amount uh, of discharges going into the other waterways best case scenario is what i've got a chance to see in person uh when i toured the green cane project in brazil world's largest organic regenerative agricultural operation of its kind that is phased out uh um the use of all chemical harmful uh, uh, pesticides, fertilizers, you name it, uh, you know, and these are the same fertilizers that are a big issue when we're talking about, um, uh, you know, uh, runoff in the surrounding waterways and, and how that contributes to our ongoing water quality problems, algal blooms, et cetera. So, uh, you know, and I've given other uh, separate presentations just on the benefits of the Green Cane Project That's and how this could benefit Florida. That's one of the main things to hit right there. Uh, is the fact that, uh, uh, you know, and, and organic sugarcane too. Uh, Florida Crystals grow some organic sugarcane, which means uh, they're following all the rules. Not only are they not burning the sugarcane, they're not using the chemical pesticides, uh, chemical fertilizers. 
you know, which lead uh, to these water quality problems, uh, et cetera. So, so certainly, I mean, there's a lot of research that shows when we talk about water quality, I'm not even getting into the fact uh, of um, atmospheric deposition and the amount of, uh, of pollutants in the ash, and uh, which includes the levels of phosphorus and nitrogen, which we, we, we do know uh, contributes to algal blooms too, and uh, does in a harder to quantify level get into the surrounding waterways too. So, you know, really any way you break it down, uh, it, when we're talking about a shift to green harvesting, it's not just talking about improving the air quality, we're talking about improving the water quality too. Thank you so much. Um, so in, in the remaining time we have, I'd like to give every one of our wonderful panelists an opportunity to say a, a few final words um, about how we can make this the last burn season. What can we do? What can the audience who's listening do? And, and I'll start with you, Colin. All righty. Uh, once again, thank you all for being here with us today. I, I, we, I know we gave you all a lot of information, um, but what I would encourage each and every one of you to do is to speak out. Speak up, speak out. If you are part of any club organization, talk within your clubs and your organizations to get them to create proclamations, uh, resolutions, whatever uh, uh, written correspondence to get next to your elected officials to help us to deal with the, the issues we're faced with. And just uh, this is a, a, a once again, a win-win that we're talking about. Just think about within the tobacco industry and cigarette smoking. It was proven that secondhand smoke is a large contributor to cancer, respiratory issues, and many other health problems. Well, sugarcane burning is direct and secondhand smoke. So we know what it's doing to our health. We just have to speak up and speak out, such as the individuals did in the Carolinas uh, when and, and throughout the country, really, when we found out the, the health issues surrounded with tobacco smoke. So let's get involved and get charged up. Also, those of us that's uh, thinking about running for political office or who is already in political office, do not accept that money from Big Sugar. Do not accept it. All money is not good money. You're harming the people that has voted for you. You came out, you laid out your platform, you told them all the wonderful things that you would love to do within your communities, but then you turn around and vote against the said people who put you in office to protect an industry that's harming us. Don't do that, don't do that. It's not good, it's not right, and you're gonna be held to an account one day. If it's not here on earth, it'll def definitely be in the afterlife. And just think about that. Our riches are in our afterlife. We do have an afterlife. So if you're not being held to an account here, you will be held to an account uh, by our Heavenly Father. And that's what I have to say. Thank you all so very much for having me. Thank you, Colin. You've been excellent. Robert, how can we make this the last burn season? We'll continue as, as my brother Colin just said, God speak out. He or she who stands for nothing will fall for anything. Listen, Muck City, surrounding areas, Indian Town, Harlem and Clouston, we cannot continue to be silent. That gets us nothing. If you look at right now, as I told you earlier, the community to the east that enjoy more protections than we do, guess what they did? They simply spoke out. They simply spoke out. And, and guess what? All of this, oh God, it's going to take forever. And oh my God, how long will we deal with this burning? Guess what? It only took one year to get those protections over to the east, and that was over 20 years ago. So 1992, the people to the coast been enjoying better protections than the people of the muck for over 20 years. Come on, guys, we cannot allow that. And listen, and remember, as, as Colin said, our Heavenly Father, for the ones that do believe in that right there, remember, he does not give the spirit of fear. So if fear is leading you, throw that out the, out the way. Now, wisdom and, and knowledge that we do have now, let's take the knowledge so that our communities cannot continue to perish up on the things that we should not perish under because we have too much knowledge for that. So I thank the panels here. I thank our allies. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Colin, for your service in so many ways. Did y'all not hear that our brother here was affected with his job mm -hmm. for speaking out? Monk City, what kind of people are we that we would allow that to happen, especially when they're telling the truth? 
because you're right. The truth sets us free and never forget that. And we're speaking nothing but truth today. So thank you guys again for tuning in. And let's let, I need your voices out there. Please support us right now. Guys, um, also leave your links right here. Anybody willing to share your stories to let us know. Let us let, let us know how bad it is because we already know it. We're experiencing it. I am you. I already know it. I know when I talk to you guys, you tell me the truth. But we got to make sure that we just say it um, in a way that other people that are willing to come in and make sure um, that we hold people accountable, like our ad commissioner, Nikki Free. How dare she? How dare she? Because she heard the cries of, of, of us. She was there with Patrick before I joined and Colin, before I joined the campaign, letting us know that she was going to fight for us. And she left us hanging high and dry. So don't forget that. But anyway, everybody else have a blessed day. Thank you so much, Robert. I, I love the passion you bring. And I think it inspires those of us who don't live in the glades and have to suffer from this to be better allies. So thank you so much. Um, Patrick, final words for you about the last burn season. Yes. Uh, uh, real quick, I think this is an important uh, uh, point to, to, to touch upon. Uh, you know, we're talking about uh, the, the current discriminatory regulations which are in place, which prioritize protecting uh, uh, more wider and affluent communities uh, in Central and Eastern Palm Beach County. But guess what? That doesn't mean that those uh, regulations in place are even doing a, a very good job uh, of protecting those communities. We hear, I hear all the time uh, 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 from folks, from families uh, who live in Wellington, Royal Palm Beach to this day, uh, who have family members who suffer from uh, asthma, respiratory issues that, uh, uh, you know, still endure and have anger uh, and having to deal uh, with smoke and ash. Uh, you know, and it, it doesn't matter if it, if it affects, uh, you know, different. I've heard from people in Broward County. Uh, I've heard from people, uh, you know, west side of the lake, as far as Fort Myers, you know, this time of the year, uh, they believe that they're impacted by this. And, and what I got to say to you is, is you know, uh, this, is, this is as much of a movement for you uh, as, you know, it certainly is uh, for the folks in the glaze. We're all stronger together. Uh, and, you know, as uh, you know, we're in the process of building this movement up uh, and you're a membership or you, you're, you're, you're a member of, of local groups. It doesn't matter what side of the, of the party you're on. Take actions. Uh, you can reach out to me to uh, schedule a presentation to this campaign. Get engaged. We'll keep you in the loop. Got a lot of work to do, but uh, uh, but man, it's it's really uh, uh, starting to kick into the next level. And um, you know, uh, we invite uh, you know all of Florida uh, uh, to take part in this movement for justice. And another thing, I want to empower folks uh, uh, to do uh, that they can do on a daily, you know, weekly basis as they go grocery shopping. We know sugar's endemic; it's everywhere. But what you can do. Uh, as a consumer to be a part of the solution and not part of the problem is look for the organic label. As I referenced earlier, organic sugar cane uh, per USDA standards cannot be uh, uh, produced uh, uh, from burnt fields. So uh, by you using your purchasing power, you're sending a message to the industry. Oh, well, you know, the consumers uh, are wanting more of this uh, organic sugar cane and that comes from green harvesting a uh, sugar cane versus burning it. And guess what? They're starting to learn about all the negative impacts we try to keep uh, uh, on the wraps uh, as well. So, you know, you just just empower yourself. Uh, you are empowered uh, if you feel, oh, you know, what can I do? Uh, David versus Goliath thing uh, is, is, hey, spread the word, educate the public, uh, make sure to just buy organic sugar cane and get engaged in this campaign because as we've been seeing, the more folks that become aware, the more they want to take action. And as that pressure reaches critical mass, there's no quicker way to end this injustice uh, uh, by just that critical mass of people coming together and making their demands known versus relying on a, 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 you know, a, a politician to come in a white horse uh, and save the day or relying on the legal system. The quickest way uh, is, is you know, for y'all to join the movement, spread the word, uh, advocate. So uh, I'll just leave you at that. Uh, and we'll share some links. StopTheBurn.org website um, is a great resource to educate yourself. Follow our social media pages and uh, stay tuned.
Thank you, Patrick. We are stronger together. Like you said, let's make this the last burn season, but I guarantee you this will not be the last conversation. So let's keep talking about it. Thank you all. You are a wealth of knowledge and I'm just so grateful you joined us today. And thank you to our audience too. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank, thank you everyone. You. Yes.